I've worshipped at Trinity Lockleys and I'm filling in this last, last week and this week. Whenever we look at an event in history, and that's what we're looking at in Ezra chapter 6, verses 13 to the end, we look at a little event, but it's always part of a big picture. So I'm a bit of a World War II buff. The Battle of Britain was one of the great battles and key points in World War II, but it was part of a big story that had been coming for a long time and there was a lot that followed after it. And in this second half of chapter 6, we see the completion, the dedication and the restoration of worship in the second temple. But it's part of a big story. The story of the temple is the story of the heart of God that the dwelling place of God will be with men. That was the heart of God back in the garden. The fall interrupted it. And the story of the Bible is, that is what's on God's heart, to bring back the dwelling place of God to be with men. And we see that fulfilled in the book of the Revelation. So as we come to this chapter, we want to think of it as the temple being complete. But the temple is incomplete, it's not complete. And we'll see that from the, from the background to this text. But there's hope. The temple will one day be complete. So with those thoughts, let's pray and get into the chapter. Father, we thank you that we can meet today and break open this holy book, the very words of God. So would you cleanse my thoughts, my sinful lips, cleanse our hearts and help us to hear what you say, that the word of the Lord would come to us just as really as it came to Haggai back in those days. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we come to chapter 6, the second half of it, we see the story is that the exiles had come back, commanded to build the, build the temple. And they'd started it, but in chapter 4, there's opposition and they stop. In chapter 5, Haggai and Zechariah prophesy and they start to build again. Opposition comes again, but this time they keep going. And, <coughs> and the governors, Tatanai and uh, Shatar, Bozanai, send a letter to King Darius. Say, look, these people say that they're building this temple. They say Cyrus uh, ordered it to be built. Is this true? What are we to do? Darius uh, causes a search in the records and they find the command of Cyrus and he writes back to them in chapter 6 and says, leave them alone, give them everything they need to build this temple and just to encourage them, he says, if you don't do that, then a, a, a piece of timber will be taken from your house and you'll be impaled upon it. So that was a bit of an encouragement. So the Passover was instituted Back then is in um, Exodus chapter 12. God had sent Moses to Egypt saying, let my people go. Pharaoh said no. God sent nine plagues. Pharaoh still refused. And God said, if you don't, I will destroy your firstborn. And on the particular day of the night of the Passover, God said to Moses, you take blood and put it on the lintels of the doors of the houses and everyone who's in the house will be protected. Those who aren't, how many are there firstborn in this place? Any firstborn? Okay. You would have been pretty keen for your dad to put plenty of blood on the lintel. And those who didn't, the firstborn died from the least to the house of Pharaoh. And they leave, and every year they keep this Passover to remember the deliverance. And now this is the first time back in the land after the exile, they keep the Passover to remember the deliverance from Egypt, but now to remember the return from exile. So they, there's joy. So the temple is built, 
It's dedicated and worship is reinstituted. But the temple is incomplete because in Haggai we read this verse, Haggai chapter 2 verse 3. But who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you as nothing? Because though this house was built, those who remembered the first temple, Solomon's temple, knew in their hearts that this was nothing. It was as nothing in its construction. So though the, this temple was built on the same footprint, that first temple was glorious. The walls were covered with gold. Everything was covered with gold. And this temple was stone and wood, it would seem. In its construction, it seemed as nothing. But then in the celebrations, they offered 100 cattle, 200 rams, 400 lambs, 12 goats. In 1 Kings chapter 8, we read that when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into that first temple, they sacrificed sheep and oxen that could not be numbered. Countless. And then... When they dedicated the temple, Solomon sacrificed, get this, 22,000 oxen. That's a massive herd of oxen. 120,000 sheep. That's a huge stock of sheep. So the people who remembered that first house and who read 1 Kings 8 would have seen that this was as nothing. And then... To those who were there, the, the very people were as nothing. They were exiles. In verse 16 we read, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the exiles. They were slaves, even in their own land. That first temple, they were their own nation, a free people under the greatest king, perhaps, apart from Jesus, who, who was at that time Solomon, all the nations, the wisest man on earth, they brought tribute to him. They were a free people in their country. This temple seemed as nothing. But the real nothingness of this temple is that it was really a temple in form only. The temple had an outer court where the people could go, and there was the brazen altar where they offered sacrifices, the priests offered sacrifices. Then there was the holy place where the priests could go, and there was the table with the bread, the showbread, and the menorah, the, the great candlestick, and the lamp that burnt. And then there was a curtain and the most holy place. And in the most holy place in Solomon's temple was the Ark of the Covenant, the ark was a box covered with gold. In it was the table, two tables of the law, representing God's law. But this was the second set of tables. The first set of tables were given to Moses on Mount Sinai, written by the finger of God, made by God. And when Moses came down and saw the people worshipping the golden bulls that they'd created, and dancing naked, he threw the tables, the, those two tablets on the ground, and they were broken. So when after the people were judged, and he's called back up the mountain, God tells him, you make two tables of stone, and you bring them up, and it seems he wrote the Ten Commandments himself on those two tables. So it was, these tables were a symbol of God's law, but also a symbol of man's disobedience. So that's in the ark. On top of the ark was a mercy seat. It was a seat covered with gold. And looking down on those, that mercy seat were two cherubim, angelic beings with their wings outstretched. And it was as if the judgment of God, the justice of God, looked down on the sin of man, and between the judgment of God and the sin of man was the mercy seat where the priests would go in once a year and sprinkle the blood. Because the only place that sinful man 
and holy God, where the habitation of God can be with men, is through the blood. And the Apostle Paul takes that up in Romans 3, which is the high point of the gospel. And he says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's us. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And verse 25, who God put forward as a propitiation through faith in his blood. That word propitiation in the Greek hilasterion is mercy seat. And so Paul is saying that the place where we sinful men can have the habitation of God is through the blood. That's the only way we can ever come. And this temple had no ark. This temple was a temple in form only. But perhaps even more significantly, in the first temple, you can read it in 1 Kings chapter 8, when the ark was put in the holy place, the Shekinah, the dwelling glory of God, came into the temple. And the priests couldn't stand because of the glory of God. In this most holy place, there was light. The glory, the habitation of God was with men in that most holy place. This temple, the second temple, was dark. The glory was not there. We read in Ezekiel, because of the sin of man, before the destruction of the first temple, the glory of God left the threshold of the temple. And this temple, it didn't come back. So to those who knew, this temple was incomplete in its construction, in the celebrations, in the people. There was no ark and there was no Shekinah glory. There was no dwelling place of God. But, as always, God never leaves us with the hopelessness of the situation. He gives us hope. And Haggai went on to say this, verse 6 in chapter 2. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. Or other translations say, the desire of nations will come. The silver is mine, I will shake all nations, what is desired of nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the former house, says the Lord, and in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. There was this wonderful promise that the glory of this house will be greater than the former house. And in, on a physical level, in AD, about BC 50, Herod the Great rebuilt the temple. He pulled it out piece by piece and rebuilt it. It was glorious. There was gold on the, on the, on the porch, Solomon's porch. It was a magnificent structure. But the real glory comes when the desire of nations comes into the temple. And he first came as a 12-year-old. We read it in Luke chapter 2. And he sits in the temple and talks to the elders and questions them. And Mary, his mom, and Joseph, his supposed dad, come and say, where were you? And he said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? And then as he commences his ministry, John chapter 2, he comes back into the temple. And he sees the merchandise and he makes a whip and he cleanses the temple. And he says, my father's house shall not be a place of merchandise. As he goes on in his ministry, we see him in John chapter 7 come into the temple in the Feast of the Tabernacles. That feast was when they remembered the dwelling in the wilderness. And there was a point where they'd blow trumpets and then they'd pour water from the pool of Siloam on the floor to symbolize the rock that followed them through the desert and gave them water. And John 7 says, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus comes into the temple. They blow the trumpets, they pour the water out, and then there's a period of silence in the temple. And it seems, you have to 
sort of infer this, that in that moment of silence, this young man stands up and says, he cries, if any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he's saying, I was the rock that followed you. I gave you water. You come to me. But they start to argue and push back. Then John chapter 10, the shepherd chapter, he's in the temple again. And he says, my sheep hear my voice and follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no man shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And in the temple, the desire of nations says, I'm God. I'm the person for whom this temple is built. And they take up stones to stone him. And in the last week of his life, in the Passion Week, he comes back into the temple. Again he cleanses it. My father's house shall be a house of prayer. And he teaches in the temple. And it says in Matthew that he healed the blind and the lame. He had done most of his work, his healings in Galilee, but now the desire of nations is in the temple and he's healing the lame and the blind. And the children are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. They got it. But the Jewish elders say, stop these people. Look what they're saying. And he said the very stones would cry out. And in the rest of those chapters leading on to Matthew 24, he's in debate with the Jewish leaders. In Matthew 21, 43, he declares judgment on the nation. The kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. In Matthew 23, there's the war chapter. He declares war to the Jewish leaders. War, war, war. It's like in your face. And he finishes by his lament over Jerusalem. Or Jerusalem... Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings? But you would not. And behold, your house is left to you desolate. And you will not see me anymore until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24. And you read this amazing, poignant statement. Matthew 24, verse 1 Jesus left the temple. The desire of nations, the glory of God had come into the temple. His people had rejected him and the glory departs from the temple, just as the Shekinah did back there in Ezekiel. And the next statement Jesus says is, not one stone will be left on top of another. When he died, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, signifying that the temple system was now finished. The dwelling place of God could be with men because of the cross. And then in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit comes down on the church of Jesus through the, at Pentecost. And God builds a new temple the book of Ephesians says that we are built for a habitation of God through the Spirit, built into a holy temple, living stones for a habitation of God through the Spirit. You are here today not just as people, as families, but as temples of the living God. The Spirit of God lives in every believer. And as we come together, we are part of the temple of the living God in this world. And it's throughout the world, not in one place anymore in Jerusalem, but throughout this world from Sweden, there's Christians in Siberia, in South Africa, in Chile, in Fiji, in Tasmania, through Asia, in China. The, living, the temple of the living God now is throughout this world. The glory of God is filling the world through his people. But even that's not the end. Because the book of Zechariah has these mysterious verses. 
at the end, which tell us there's going to be a third temple, it would seem. It says at the end of Zechariah, verse 20, chapter 14, on that day, holy to the Lord will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the cooking pots in the Lord's house. And you can read in Ezekiel, the, the prophet prophesies of another temple. But even that temple is not the end. Because Revelation 21 says, the dwelling place of God will be with men. And God will wipe away every tear from our eye. There will be no sorrow, no sighing, no pain, for the former things are passed away. And then the heavenly Jerusalem comes down and it says there's no temple there for the Lamb, the Lord and the Lamb will be the temple. Brethren, we are part of something enormous, this big story that one day the dwelling place of God will be with men. And that, in that place, in that day, there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears. Have you ever, have you ever cried? Have you ever felt lost? Have you ever felt pain? Have you ever felt the loss of debt? One day, when the dwelling place of God will be with men, that will be no more. The former things are passed away. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ here today, lift your vision, lift your hearts for this glory that's coming to us when the dwelling place of God will be with men. And if you're not, and if you have questions and arguments about this thing called the faith of Jesus, Christianity. Just for a moment, open your mind, because if you reject this, you reject the most magnificent thing in all the world. God is doing a work to take us to that place when the habitation of God will be with men. There'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Do not miss that. Do not miss that. So what does this chapter tell us? It's a chapter that on its own is a story of the rebuilding of a temple in far-off Israel. But as we look into it, we see that it's part of God's grand plan for the dwelling place of God to be with men. And he's fulfilling that now through us, the assembled church of Jesus Christ. But this meeting, this getting together is but a foretaste of that wonderful day when the dwelling place of God will be with men, when the former things are passed away, there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. Be a part of that. And as you go into this week, and as you go into your work and your school and uni and all the things that bring our attention down to the nitty-gritty of this life, pause and for a moment think of the glory that awaits us. We are part of a big story. We are part of a grand story. It's a wonderful thing to be the people of Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that there's coming, in this troubled world, there's coming a day when the dwelling place of God will be with men. We thank you that is true today as you dwell in our hearts and you dwell in our hearts by the assembled church. But we thank you for that day that's coming when there'll be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. No more temple for the dwelling place of God will be with men. And Lord, we so want to be in that day. Would you come, Lord Jesus? Amen.